In this series of videos, we're going to be looking at veins and venous disease. So we'll be doing a little bit about the normal anatomy and physiology of veins, but that is dealt with in detail in other places. So we're going to be focusing primarily on peripheral venous disease, largely the way that venous incompetence has problems associated with the legs. This first video considers the causes of chronic venous insufficiency. So the veins aren't working properly and we're seeking to understand why they are not working properly, why they have become incompetent and insufficient for the venous drainage requirements of the limb. And as well as helping us understand and contextualize the disorder, this might also start us thinking about some ways to prevent chronic venous insufficiency in the future. Chronic venous insufficiency. Chronic means it's an ongoing condition. Venous sits to do with the veins. And insufficiency means there is not enough physiological function in the veins for the body's venous drainage requirements. Now this is relatively common actually. It's been estimated that between two and 5% of the total population suffers from symptomatic chronic venous insufficiency. And uh, well, at least 40% have some regurgitation problems in veins causing varicose veins and things like that. So what's going on here? Well, we need to think about our basic anatomy and uh, physiology. We have the three main veins, three, three main systems of veins in the limbs. And here they are, the superficial, the deep and the perforator veins. Now this is the periphery down here and the blood needs to move back up to the centre of the body up here. And to make sure that there's one way flow of blood, the veins have valves. These valves are bicuspid. They have two cusps. And they will let the blood flow from here up the way, but then the valves will swing shut if there's any back pressure of the blood. So a valve is a structure which ensures one way, one way flow of blood. And actually these valves aren't that substantial. They're just infolds of the inner lining of the blood vessel, the tunica interna. So they're actually fairly thin folds. The vein walls themselves would be a bit uh, thicker the tunica media and the tunica externa. So this will be the walls of the veins. The walls aren't as thick as arteries, but you know, they are reasonably substantial walls. It's what you've got to stick your needle through when you're doing venipuncture, of course. Now, <coughs> These perforator veins are so called because they perforate the muscle fascia. So the deep veins are inside muscles. So here we have a muscle. And the deep veins are inside the muscle. So this is all muscle here. Calf muscle perhaps in the leg. So these veins are inside the muscle and they perforate the muscle fascia. The muscle fascia is the layer of tough fibrous tissue over the top of the, uh, over the top of the muscle. Sometimes these veins are called communicator veins because they communicate between the superficial and the deep systems. Some people actually call them uh, anastomotic veins because they form an anastomosis. But they also contain valves in this direction. Now the thing to grasp here is the superficial veins are relatively low pressure. They're the low pressure system, whereas the deep veins, the pressure can be high. They can be high pressure. <coughs> 
And there's valves inside the deep veins as well. And again, they're pointing in this direction because we want the flow to go from the periphery back towards the center. So again, this means blood can flow from here through to here. But then if there's any back pressure in the blood there, that will shut those valves, preventing regurgitation. So at least that is the, uh, that's the physiological situation. That's what happens normally. So normally, blood will be coming into, uh, well, some blood will drain straight into the deep veins or the blood will drain into the superficial system, such as the saphenous veins, for example. And the blood will go from there to there. And then when it tries to go back, that valve will shut and it won't let it go. Now, what happens here is um, when this muscle contracts, that muscle contracts, and when a muscle contracts, it shortens. So muscle contraction is going to greatly increase the pressure of the blood inside the deep veins. So this muscle is going to contract and squeeze on that vein. It's going to close that vein off like that. It's going to close it off, greatly increasing the pressure. Now, if you increase the pressure in this compartment here, you increase the pressure of blood in that compartment there, what's that going to do to this valve? Well, it's going to close that valve. So that valve will be closed, preventing regurgitation. But that valve will be opened so the blood will go up, back towards the center. And muscle contraction is an active process. It's a vigorous process. So when that happens, the blood scoots back up, the contraction of the muscles. But then when the muscle relaxes, the walls of the vein are going to tend to open again, and that's going to reduce the pressure in here. And when the pressure in there is reduced, the blood is going to go from the low pressure system through the perforator, veins into the high pressure system. Then that will contract, that blood will shoot back up very quickly and efficiently. When the muscle relaxes, that's going to open the vein, lowering the pressure, sucking more blood in. So all the time we have blood going from the superficial veins through to the deep veins, through the perforator veins. And of course, this is the normal situation. This is what happens normally. But in chronic venous insufficiency syndrome, these valves do not function properly. There is disorder of the valves within the veins. And a common cause for this is that perhaps further up, further up in this system, in fact, very commonly, the pathology starts where the great saphenous vein joins the femoral vein up near the inguinal ligament at the top. Then the blood kind of progressively dams back. But let's imagine that that's a valve further up. Then what can happen is there's a condition called a deep venous thrombosis. A DVT, of course. Now, in a DVT, what happens is, um, well, a thrombus uh, is where there's blood clotting where it shouldn't, so you'll get blood clotting around about a valve, typically around about a valve. And that's a deep venous thrombosis. And these are probably more common than we think. There's probably quite a lot of DVTs which don't give rise to the classic clinical features of DVTs that we uh, learn to recognize, such as the swelling and the redness and the pain. But what these deep venous thromboses will do is they will damage this valve. They will damage the valve. So if that valve is damaged, then the blood can regurgitate back the way. This is pathological. It's not supposed to go back the way. And if the blood is coming back the way here, what's that going to do to the pressure on this valve? Well, I think you can see it's going to increase the pressure in that valve. So you can get a sort of a cascade effect down through the valves. Now, in practice, this pathological process often starts with the um, superficial veins. About 80% of cases of chronic venous insufficiency, it starts with the superficial veins.
and damage to the valves in the superficial veins. It can, it can be both. It can be the deep and the superficial systems that are involved. But, but let's imagine now that there's a problem with the valves. And another set lot of valves that often go wrong are in these perforator. These perforator valves go wrong. So let's think the perforator valves have gone wrong now. If the perforator valves aren't working properly, when the muscle contracts, that's going to increase the pressure there. Yes, some of the blood will scoot off there. The valve in the deep vein is more likely to be intact, so that's going to be okay, the blood won't go back. But if those valves in the perforator veins aren't working, can you see the blood's going to go back from the high pressure deep venous system into the low pressure superficial system? And that will engorge these veins with blood and they can become dilated and tortuous, the varicosed situation. But whenever the valves aren't working, that's going to increase the pressure, particularly in the superficial veins. So there's going to be raised venous pressure. There's going to be venous hypertension. So chronic venous insufficiency can lead to chronic venous hypertension. caused by the failure of the valves. And DVT, whether symptomatic or silent DVT, is a common cause of this. Sometimes this used to be called post-thrombotic syndrome. It's a simplification, but... Other times there can be um, this one. Phlebitis. That is inflammation in the veins often caused by bacterial infection, but the inflammation in the veins is likely again to damage the valves, causing valvular incompetence. Other times people are just born with poor quality veins. Congenital, or poor quality valves anyway. In fact, some people are born without valves at all and have this uh, quite severely from, from early life. So they're common conditions that can lead to this syndrome because they damage the valves. There's an increase in the pressure of the blood. There's regurgitation of blood into the superficial venous system. So where the pathology begins doesn't matter too much if it begins in a superficial vein or if it begins in a deep vein. If it began in a deep vein, for example, I think you can see that the increased pressure there would put a lot of pressure on the perforator valves and over time that they, they, they would fail because of the increased pressure and we're going to get this venous hypertension particularly in the superficial veins causing varicosity and other other clinical features that we'll look at so what else can lead to this condition well we know it's more common in developed countries Probably due to lifestyle factors. We know it's more common with uh, increasing age. But again, most things are. There's more time for things to go wrong. And we know it's associated often after uh, pregnancy. Now, the reason here, we used to think it was because the gravid uterus was very large and pressed on the inferior vena cava and that caused back pressure but now it's believed to be a progesterone effect. The hormone, a progesterone. Like all conditions, there's a family history. If your mum or your dad had it, it's more likely you'll get it. Obesity is a problem. The obesity is caused by um, compression of the veins, particularly the inferior vena cava. Because of course, if this goes on to become the femoral vein, that's going to drain into the iliac and then the inferior vena cava. There's debate over standing, but some research shows that people that stand a lot in their occupations, there's a lot of back pressure, especially if they can't walk around very much. <laughs> 
Other research studies show that that's not particularly a big factor, but it probably is a small factor, or certainly a, or a bigger factor in people that are genetically predisposed to it. Uh, smoking. Studies have shown that smoking is a etiological factor, a causative factor in in men at least. Although overall this condition is more common in, in women, perhaps because of the progesterone effect. And then there's injuries. Direct injury to the veins damaging the valves. And also I've seen this with indirect injury, a patient who had a fixation of the ankle joint and because they couldn't move their ankle they were unable to use the calf muscle pump effectively and they developed chronic venous hypertension and chronic venous insufficiency syndrome. So it all depends, the normal venous drainage or depends on these valves working properly. Venous drainage is facilitated by contraction of adjacent skeletal muscles, contraction of adjacent arteries, pulsation of adjacent arteries, and negative and positive pressure set up during ventilation. And this contraction of the muscle is the big one because that gives rise to the very high pressures. If the valves aren't working, there's going to be a backlog of the blood causing chronic venous hypertension. Chronic venous hypertension. And if the pressure in the veins is high, then that means the blood cannot drain out from the venules effectively. The congestion will down back to the venules. And if the venules are congested with blood, is that going to make it harder or easier for the capillaries to drain? Well, I think you can see it's probably going to make it harder. So here we have an arteriole, here we have a network of capillaries, and here we have a venule, draining from a venule. But because the veins are congested, the blood is damming back to the venules, because the blood can't get from the venules into the larger veins, and because the venules are congested, the blood can't get back from the capillaries. So this hypertension will express itself as increased hydrostatic pressure in the venules and in the capillaries, giving rise to the clinical features that we'll look at in the next video. Now blood has weight. So if there's a column of blood, that's going to weigh something. And normally the column of blood all the way from the right atrium all the way down to the ankles is broken up into sections by the valves. But if the valves are diseased and not working properly, then that column of blood becomes one long column of blood and it gets heavier as it goes down, which is going to increase the hydrostatic pressure in the vessels. So this next video clip attempts to graphically explain this pathological situation. So blood from the capillaries is going to flow into venules, the venules are going to flow into smaller veins and into a network of larger veins. And this column of blood here represents these veins in the leg. So the bottom part of the column here is representing the anterior and posterior tibial veins and the short saphenous vein. Coming up to the knee we have the popliteal popliteal vein at the level of the knee. Higher up we've got the femoral vein and as a superficial vein we've got the great uh, saphenous vein as well. Then going up as it goes through the into the pelvis we've got the external iliac vein, the common iliac vein and that's taking the blood into the inferior vena cava which of course carries on up and goes into the right atrium of the heart. Now in normal circumstances there are valves punctuating this coursework of veins and the valves allow blood to go from the periphery up towards the centre but they won't let the blood go from the centre back towards the periphery so there's a one-way flow of blood.
So the blood can go from here, through some valves to here, through some valves to here, and work its way back up. That's a simplification, of course, when you contract your calf muscle, the blood will actually scoot back up under fairly high pressure. The trouble is, of course, there's sometimes diseases of these valves can be caused by phlebitis, can be caused by deep venous thrombosis, complicating pregnancy, obesity, or some people are born with congenital absence of the bicuspid valves in their veins or, or weak valves. And these people are prone to develop chronic venous insufficiency syndrome caused by chronic venous hypertension. Now, if you think about it, if we don't have the valves punctuating the veins, then what we've got in essence is just this single column of blood. It would just be like this. I mean, I know it goes through many veins, but it's in, a, in, a, in essence one column. So without the valves, there would be one column of blood that actually goes from the right atrium all the way down through the inferior vena cava, the iliac, the femoral, down the popliteal, anterior, posterior, tibial, all the way to the ankle as one column of blood. And blood has a weight. So as you go further down this venous column, if there's no valves to compartmentalise the weight of the blood, then by the time you get down to the bottom, you're going to have very high hydrostatic pressures. And in severe chronic venous insufficiency with chronic venous hypertension, the pressures here can be 50, 60, 70, 80, even 90 millimetres of mercury pressure have been measured in people with severe venous insufficiency. And that actually explains why most venous leg ulcers are going to be low down in the leg, where the venous pressure is highest. So the most common site for venous leg ulcers is this gaiter area where they used to wear gaiters in the old days. This area of the ankle, lower part of the leg, is the gaiter area. That is the most common site for venous leg ulceration because the venous pressure is highest in there because of the hydrostatic pressure generated by this column of blood due to the venous insufficiency. So remember, normally the venous insufficiency is reduced well, the venous hypertension is reduced, in fact there isn't any normally, because of the valves. In fact, in, in normal situations, when you're exercising, if you've got healthy veins, the pressure in these veins will be almost zero when you're exercising. So normally the valves do a very good job of keeping this pressure low. But if the valves are damaged, chronic venous hypertension is going to lead to chronic venous insufficiency syndrome. Now, if we're going to accurately assess and diagnose a condition, we have to know the clinical features and understand why those clinical features present. And this is particularly important in peripheral vascular disease because you can get peripheral venous disease and you can get peripheral arterial disease. And in peripheral venous disease, we need to treat that with compression therapy. But in peripheral arterial disease, that's contraindicated. We mustn't use compression because that will further compromise the ischemic circulation by pressing on the already diseased vessels and reducing the blood supply still further. So understanding the clinical features and arriving at a correct diagnosis is particularly important in peripheral vascular disease. Chronic venous insufficiency syndrome, relatively common, especially in westernized countries, associated with venous hypertension. But in this clip, we want to look at the clinical features of the condition. What do the patients suffer from and how do we recognize it? Now, the first thing I want to talk about is ankle, brachial, pressure index. Now the ankle brachial pressure index is the ratio between the blood pressure in the brachial artery and in the posterior tibial artery in the in the ankle. <clears throat> 
Now, if someone's got peripheral arterial vascular disease, the blood pressure in the brachial artery is going to be higher than the blood pressure in the ankle. And that points out to peripheral arterial insufficiency, peripheral arterial disease. But we're not talking about arterial disease, we're talking about venous disease. So it's important to differentiate because it's got significant implications for the treatments. So in a, a normal situation, the blood pressure is going to be pretty well the same in the brachial artery and in the uh, posterior tibial artery in the ankle. So the ratio we would expect in a normal person, theoretically, to be about one to one. That would be normal. And what we say is there's peripheral vascular disease present if it's less than uh, 0 0.8. In other words, if the blood pressure is 20% lower, the systolic blood pressure is 20% lower in the ankle compared to the arm. So in chronic venous insufficiency syndrome, the ankle brachial pressure index is going to be normal. So that's going to be normal. Now, another feature that we can get is varicosities. Varicosity, varicose veins. And we can also get another feature called an ankle flare. Now, varicosities are the torturous dilated superficial veins, the varicose veins that we see in the leg. You can actually get varicose veins in other parts of the body, in the esophagus, for example, esophageal varices. But here we're talking about the legs. So you can get varicosity as a result of the chronic venous hypertension. The varicosity normally caused by failure of the valves in the perforator veins allowing reflux of blood from the high pressure deep venous system into the superficial low pressure system. And the ankle flares caused by dilated small vessels such as venules, dilated venules around the ankle. And what you tend to notice is when the leg goes down into a dependent position, the gravity fills up these small vessels and we get this discoloration in the ankle. So this is, uh, this is a differential diagnosis, this one. Just trying to classify these a bit because it gets a bit confusing having just lists of clinical features. These ones are caused by the uh, reflux of blood, the ankle flare and the varicosity, so they kind of go together. Now, the increased hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries means that the tissue fluid is not effectively reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary as normal. This means there's accumulation of fluid in the tissue spaces. In the UK we call that edema, in the States you leave off the O, oh, it's edema, it's the same really. So we can get this uh, edematous swelling, very characteristic of peripheral venous disease. So we get swelling. Now, of course, edema can be caused by localised venous disease. But it's important to remember that edema can also be caused by systemic disease. So edema can be caused by congestive heart failure or it can be caused by renal failure. So it's important to differentiate whether the cause of the edema is localised or systemic, because the treatments are going to be different. And one way to start thinking about this is, if it's a systemic cause of the edema, it's likely to be bilateral. The edema is likely to be the same in both legs. Whereas with chronic venous insufficiency, while it can affect both legs, typically one is worse than the other. And this gives rise to the leg feeling very, uh, very tight the skin feels tight and the patients complain that it feels tight. Now the edema is caused by the increased movement of water from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment. And I'm just gonna write another word down here, 
hemo sid erosis hemosiderosis hemosiderosis now hemosiderosis is the brown staining that is characteristic of chronic venous insufficiency syndrome what actually happens is the well you're aware of the fact that there's these uh, capillaries with the vascular endothelial cells but because there's chronic venous hypertension the size of the gap is increased because the capillaries are being opened up by the increased internal hydrostatic pressure inside normally of course the red blood cells don't fit out of the small vessels but because there's increased size of the gaps in between the vascular endothelial cells, the red cells can escape into the tissue spaces. So we get extravasation and we get red cells in the tissue spaces. Now these are phagocytosed, so the cells themselves are removed, but the pigments are left. The haemoglobin pigment is left and that gives rise to the brown staining. And the brown staining is caused by the presence of hemosiderin. And hemosiderin is the brown breakdown product of the hemoglobin, causing the hemosiderosis. So I think it's fair to say in all cases of chronic venous insufficiency syndrome, there's going to be some brown staining. It's a very diagnostic feature. And when you see the brown staining, the hemosiderin causing the hemosiderosis, then that is pretty well diagnostic of uh, venous insufficiency. And I'm going to kind of group these together because they're related to the increased permeability of the capillaries. I know when you're trying to learn clinical features, learning lists is just amusing, but if you can sort of work out what's causing it, it starts to make a, a bit of sense. Now, another thing that these patients complain of is uh, cramps. Cramps. Now, part of this is that because the blood flow, the blood is not able to flow freely through the small blood vessels, then less fresh blood is able to get in. Because, because the blood that's here can't get out at the venous end of the capillary, it's harder for the blood to get in at the arterial end of the capillary. So there's less flow through of blood. That means the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissue cells. So the tissue cells will be in this space here. They're getting less oxygen, they're gonna be hypoxic and that can give rise to the accumulation of lactic acid. And the swelling is going to press on the small vessels as well. So because there's a lot of fluid accumulating in this intravascular space, it's not unreasonable to assume that if there's some small blood vessels like an arterial that's feeding a capillary bed here, there can be pressure on the small blood vessels, reducing the blood supply to the capillaries therefore reducing the oxygen supply to the cells. So these cramps give rise to um, throbbing, um, aching. You know, it just feels um, unpleasant, the leg feels uh, unpleasant. And as well as that, you're going to get leg fatigue. the patients complain that their legs feel tired. And the reduced blood supply means that the skin is less viable. So we get skin atrophy. Atrophy just means a, a deterioration of. So the quality of the skin is reduced, there's atrophy of the skin. And over time, this can result in lipo, Dermo, 
lipodermosclerosis. Now, some people call it lipodermatosclerosis. But... So lipo is the uh, fats. The dermo is the dermis. Sclerosis means hardening. So over time, the reduced blood supply and just the reduced viability of the whole thing mean that the adipocytes in the subcutaneous tissue are going to die off. And they're replaced by scar tissue, hard scar tissue. And characteristically, what this causes is uh, the champagne sort of shaped leg. So you get the legs kind of swollen here in the calf, but then it goes down to a very thin ankle in the gator area, like an upside down champagne bottle. So we have edema here causing the swelling on top. But then because the subcutaneous tissue has been replaced here by fibrous tissue, this is very hard here. And it feels hard when you, when you touch it because the fat has been replaced by scar tissue. So fat, skin, hardening, but actually the fat is replaced by fibrous, fibrous tissue. So I'm going to group those two together because they're all this group together because this is kind of related to poor blood supply. the lipodermosclerosis, the cramps, the leg fatigue, the skin atrophy. Now another feature that patients complain of is eczema. And eczema actually is just uh, another word for dermatitis. Dermatitis is actually probably a much better term because it's uh, inflammation of, I-T-I-S, inflammation of the dermis. Eczema is a bit of an old fashioned term really. But this is associated with uh, itching. These legs are often very itchy. And also something else called um, restless legs. Now, thinking here, my thinking here is that these are probably caused by the accumulation of uh, toxins and things in the, in the leg. Um, the accumulation of toxins will stimulate the, so the, um, the receptors, the, the peripheral sensory receptors in the, in the dermis. And actually we know now that in the dermis there are specific receptors for itching. So these can be irritated. And again, the accumulation of toxins and things can cause restless leg syndrome. I don't know if you ever had this. I get it when I'm working nights. You just don't know where to put your legs. It's a horrible feeling in your legs and um, you need to move them all the time. So you end up having restless legs. Um, you have to keep moving around to try and reduce this unpleasant feeling in the legs. It's not a pain, but it's a very unpleasant feeling. Renal patients often complain of it as well. So we'll group those few things together as a, not very scientifically, but we'll, we'll say that they're the accumulation of toxins. Now, the pain from legs with chronic venous insufficiency and the unpleasant feelings are variable. So what makes it worse and what makes it better? What modifies the features? This is always remarkably useful when you're trying to assess a patient and diagnose a condition. I will always ask patients, what makes it worse? What makes it better? Because that tells you quite a lot about the, the nature of the pathology. So it's worse when it's warm better when it's cold. So what's happening here is in the warm, there's going to be peripheral arterial vasodilation. More blood is going to go into the limb, into the subcutaneous tissues, because there's going to be vasodilation in response to warmth. And that's going to increase the total amount of blood in the leg. So when it's warm, if we think about the, uh, 
the lag here is going to be vasodilation of the vessels going into the leg. So there's going to be more blood. Now that's okay in you because when you peripherally vasodilate, when you get arterial peripheral vasodilation in response to increased environmental temperature, then your veins will simply drain it away. But these people are unable to do that because they've got chronic, they've got ongoing venous insufficiency. And conversely, when it's cold, there's going to be peripheral arterial vasoconstriction. Less blood is going to go into the leg and that will reduce the level of congestion. Now, these people also get more pain. It's worse when the leg is lowered in the down position. Because again, if the leg is down the way, then gravity will allow more blood to flow down into the leg, increasing the level of congestion, increasing the clinical features. And conversely, when the leg is raised up the way, blood is able to drain out because it's gravity assisted. And that makes it feel a bit better for them, which is good. And also it's worse with exercise. Exercise makes it worse and rest tends to make it better. Particularly after exercise, these patients can have pain and significant discomfort. So again, when we're exercising, that's going to increase the oxygen demand of the musculature in the leg. There'll be an increased blood supply because as the levels of oxygen in the tissues drop, there's going to be a reflex of vasodilation increasing the blood supply. So more blood is going to go into the limb. But again, we can't drain it out. So the exercise is going to increase the severity of the clinical features. Whereas at rest, there's reduced blood supply going in. The congestion is not as severe. So worse when it's warm, worse when the leg is lowered, worse after exercise, better when it's cold, better when the leg is raised up to assist the gravity drainage of blood, reducing the congestion, and better at rest. So we can group those together as the better or worse clinical features. Now, venous insufficiency, as well as being unpleasant, is actually a life-threatening condition, or it can be. Because there can be complications. Infection. These patients are much more prone to infection. Cellulitis can be a life-threatening condition. In your patients with chronic venous insufficiency, always maintain a high index of suspicion for the development of infection. Because it can be life-threatening. Pain, I think, will include that as a complication. And the other one that we see very commonly and spend a lot of time treating venous ulceration. So these are all potential complications. And of course, once the ulcers form, they can be difficult to, to treat and get rid of. So that's another group of clinical features there, the complications. So it's chronic venous insufficiency syndrome. A syndrome is a group of clinical features. So we see here that there's groups of clinical features that will aid us towards the diagnosis of chronic venous insufficiency syndrome that the patients will report to us and we will observe. We will observe for the clinical signs. The patients will report the symptoms. We'll use this to make an assessment, but we remember it's a syndrome. There are a variety of clinical features that can present as a result of the chronic venous insufficiency syndrome and the chronic venous hypertension, all caused by failure of the valves, of the veins, 
that mean the blood does not flow freely from the periphery back to the centre. This is a disease of the veins, meaning that venous return is insufficient. So normal venous drainage is a physiological process. But if there's chronic venous insufficiency, that is a pathological change. And that brings about further pathological changes. It leads to further complications. So let's try and understand what these complications are and what the clinical significance of these complications will be. And that's what this next clip is about. So we're considering the complications caused by venous hypertension. Now what we have here is this is a normal capillary. So these are the vascular endothelial cells here, each with their own individual nucleus. So this could be a capillary and a lot of this physiology applies to the venules as well. So normally the blood is moving along here. The red cells are moving along here. And then it's going to drain into a larger venule here. These are other capillaries also draining into a larger venule. And of course this venule drains into a larger vein. But the problem is in the chronic venous hypertension is here we have back pressure. So the veins are damaged, the valves are compromised and the blood is damming back. Because there's high pressure in the veins, the blood's going to dam back because there's venous incompetence. And what this means is that if there's back pressure here, is that going to make it easier or harder for the blood to flow along and get out of the capillary? Well, if there's back pressure there, can you see that's going to make it harder for the blood to get along? So there's going to be reduced flow rates. The blood is going to flow more slowly than would normally be the situation. Because even though the arteries are healthy, it's able to get in here normally from the arterial. Because it can't get out, it can't get through the capillary quickly. So there's going to be reduced flow rates through the capillary. And that's also going to increase the hydrostatic pressure. Now the hydrostatic pressure is the blood pressure within this vessel. Because the blood can't get out, there's going to be an effective congestion of blood within the vessel. So we've got reduced flow rates and we've got increased hydrostatic pressure. Now, if there's reduced flow rates, can you see that those reduced flow rates will mean that there's going to be reduced flowing of glucose to the tissues, because remember the tissue cells are going to be located here in these tissue spaces. So the cells are going to get reduced amounts of glucose. And of course they need glucose, it's an essential metabolic substrate. And also they're going to get reduced amounts of amino acids. Amino acids are the essential building blocks of proteins. So it's going to be harder to maintain the viability of these cells because it's going to be harder to repair them because we haven't got the amino acids to repair them. To make collagen, of course, you need vitamin C. And the tissues also need a range of vitamins. But again, there's going to be less vitamins getting to the cells, less fatty acids. There's going to be less minerals, 
all the essential nutrients are going to have reduced delivery rates because of the reduced flow rates. Now another problem is when there's reduced flow rates the white cells tend to get a bit trapped. So here for example we have a uh, white cell. This one's a neutrophil with the multi-lobe nucleus normally between three and five lobes. The polymorphonuclear cells. So there we have a, a neutrophil. And if the neutrophils can't get through and the other white cells can't get through, then they get a bit clogged up and they tend to get adhered to the wall of the vessel. Now, white blood cells, the leukocytes, are very useful because they contain digestive enzymes that can digest viruses and bacteria. That's brilliant. But here they've got trapped. So as a result of the reduced flow rate, we have this problem called leukocyte trapping. So we have leukocyte trapping. And what this means is that some of these digestive enzymes that are contained in the cytoplasm of the leukocytes, in this case the neutrophil, some of these start to leak out. So we get leaking out of enzymes which can digest proteins, proteolytic enzymes. These proteolytic enzymes can digest protein. They are protein digesting and also oxygen free radicals. are released from the leukocytes. And these can oxidize pretty well anything, damaging it. Now you probably know that lining the capillary, there's a basement membrane. These vascular endothelial cells actually sit on a basement membrane. Very thin basement membrane, but absolutely essential. So we need this basement membrane for the vascular endothelial cells to sit on. Very fine connective tissues. But what happens is the enzymes and the oxygen free radicals from the trapped leukocytes start damaging the basement membrane. So these damage basement membrane. So we get damage to the basement membrane. And if you can see, if you damage the basement membrane, then the cells don't know where to sit and you get compromise of the circulation. We're going to get reduced blood circulation or reduced vasculature, resulting in reduced circulation. So, so far we've got reduced delivery of nutrients, we've got reduced circulation of the blood. Now, because there's back pressure here, there's going to be increased pressure in this vessel. So what I've got here is like a, this is like a cross section of a capillary or a, a venule, one of the small blood vessels. So we're now looking at it in a cross section. We notice each cell has its own individual nucleus. There's very small gaps for water and nutrients and things to go in and out of, that's normal. But because there's increased pressure in here, can you see there's now increased pressure in here, that's going to tend to force these cells apart. And if we force the cells apart, I think you can see there's now much bigger gaps between the individual cells. So we're going to get dilated vessels as a result of the reduced blood flow and the increased hydrostatic pressure. So now we've got dilated blood vessels. Now that's going to, because the vessels are dilated, can you see it's going to make it easier for the water molecules to get out 
because they're now dilated. So we're going to get edema. So there's going to be edema in the tissues. And as well as that, because the vessels are dilated, one of the clotting proteins that is normally retained within the vessel is going to be able to escape. And this is the fibrinogen. So the fibrinogen is going to be able to escape. And this is the clotting protein. Now in normal coagulation, the fibrinogen is converted to fibrin. And over time that will happen. So the fibrinogen that has escaped will be converted to fibrin. And this fibrin will form long sticky strands around about the capillary. So we get fibrin strands coalescing around the capillary. This is called a fibrin cuff. So we're going to get a fibrin cuff. And that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen that can get from the blood to the cells and reduce the amount of waste products that can get from the cells back into the blood. Now also because there's reduced flow rates, another problem we're going to get is reduced numbers of red cells, so re reduced red cell passage, reduced red cell flow rates, less red cells going through. And of course it's the red cells that carry the oxygen. So that means there's going to be reduced amounts of oxygen delivered to the tissue cells. And if there's reduced amounts of oxygen, we call this hypoxia. So hypoxia is lack of oxygen at the level of the tissues. There's going to be hypoxia. And in fact, the fibrin cuff will contribute to the hypoxia because it's forming a physical barrier. And the reduced circulation of the blood will also contribute to the hypoxia because of the reduced numbers of red cells. Now, as well as not getting enough things to the tissues, the reduced flow rates is going to mean it's harder to remove waste products. So we're going to get reduced removal of waste. So we can't get rid of the carbon dioxide. There's going to be increased carbon dioxide. And that gives rise to carbonic acid. Because the carbon dioxide plus the water gives rise to carbon dioxide. Sorry, gives rise to carbon, carbonic acid. So the increased amounts of carbon dioxide interact with the water, forming carbonic acid, which of course is an acid. And as well as that, if there's reduced amounts of oxygen, then the metabolism is going to change from aerobic to anaerobic, and that's going to give us lactic acid. The lactic acid. So you can see we've got carbonic acid and lactic acid. That of course is going to decrease the pH. It's going to make it acidic and enzymes therefore will not function properly. We're going to get reduced enzyme function. Because the functioning of the intracellular enzymes depends on an accurate pH. So the waste is not removed, the carbon dioxide builds up the carbon dioxide interreacts or reacts with the water giving rise to carbonic acid and the anaerobic metabolism gives rise to lactic acid. So we do need tissue viability and we do need wound healing sometimes. And all of these things 
that we've discussed are going to adversely impact on this. So there's reduced nutrients, all the nutrients, that's going to interfere with tissue viability and wound healing. The tissues are going to be embarrassed and compromised. The reduced blood circulation is going to interfere with tissue viability and wound healing. Oxygen is absolutely essential for wound healing. So the hypoxia will reduce tissue viability. And the acidic environment will reduce enzyme function, which will mean that the cells, the enzymes in the cells can't function, can't maintain the life of the cell normally and can't recover. The edema, because it's edematous, well, the edema is going to increase the diffusional distance for all nutrients. And indeed, it's going to increase the diffusional distance for oxygen. So that will contribute to the hypoxia. Because if there's a lot of tissue fluid between the capillaries in the cells, it's going to be harder for the oxygen to get across. It's already hard because of this fibrin cuff. So that will further exacerbate the hypoxia, which will further exacerbate tissue viability and wound healing. So the chronic venous hypertension is going to reduce the viability of the tissues. And if these factors mean that there's not enough oxygen, there's not enough nutrients, there's too much waste products for the tissue cells to survive, they will simply die. And even if the patient is able to maintain the viability of their tissues, all they often need to do is they'll have a little wound and you'll get tissue breakdown because there's no reserve in the tissues for healing. So all these adverse effects on the tissues are occurring as a result of the increased hydrostatic pressure in the veins, the disorder of the valves in the veins, meaning venous drainage is reduced, causing raised venous pressure, causing this back pressure, and this back pressure has all of these adverse effects on the viability of the tissue and on wound healing.